after introducing the fundamental concepts of mechanics in the first part, we will present the kinematic descriptions of the basic motions in nature. The content of this presentation is the following. We start with the simplest form of motion, which is the uniform linear motion. After providing a simple definition of this kind of motion and showing some examples, we will derive its equations of motion. Then we use the plots of the velocity and the distance covered by the moving body versus the time to give a short analysis of the relations between these kinematic quantities. The second basic motion which we discuss here is the free fall. We give a qualitative description on the motion of the freely falling bodies and discuss Galilei's inclined plane experiment, in which the famous scientists studied this phenomenon. We also describe other experiments, which help us to derive and analyze the equations of motion for the free fall. The next type of motion is the simple harmonic motion. We start with its qualitative description and give some examples of the harmonic motion. By applying a simple experimental setup, we can demonstrate the basic relations between the kinematic quantities of the moving body. We will introduce further quantities characterizing the periodicity of this motion, which have a crucial role in the equations of motion. In the end we show a mathematical representation using complex numbers, which allows us to provide an efficient description of the simple harmonic motion. A somewhat more complicated form of the motion is the projectile motion. First we discuss one of its special cases, namely the horizontally launched projectile. Here we also use a simple experimental setup to describe the basic properties of the motion and obtain the equations of motion. We use these results to study the general case of projectiles launched in an arbitrary direction. We provide the equations of motion and compute some basic quantities characterizing the parameters of the trajectory of the projectile. Finally we will see how we can obtain the special cases of the projectile motion from its general case. Then we present the circular and the elliptic motion. We start with the uniform circular motion and analyze the kinematic quantities of a body moving along a circle. As an example, we calculate these quantities for the moon orbiting the earth. We show how to discuss this type of motion in polar coordinates, which are well adapted to the symmetry of the trajectory of the moving body. We also present the non-uniform circular motion as a generalization of the uniform one. A further generalization of this motion is the elliptical motion, where we will demonstrate that the most convenient kinematic description of this type of motion can be obtained in the polar coordinate system. After having discussed the basic types of the one-dimensional and planar motion, we finish this presentation with one type of the spatial motion, namely the helical motion. This type of motion can be analyzed conveniently in a cylindrical coordinate system, in which we can determine the equations of motion. This motion will also use to illustrate the application of the fernet serret frame. We can determine the curvature and the torsion of the helix along which the body moves, and express them in terms of the kinematic quantities. The simplest form of motion is the uniform linear motion. By definition, a body performs a uniform linear motion if it moves along a straight line and travels equal distances in equal time intervals. In the left-hand side we can see a ball moving with a constant speed along a straight line over a surface. In the right-hand side the path of the ball is shown with the velocity vectors of the ball in two different points along the path. If a body is moving along a straight line then its velocity vector always points into the same direction, that is in the direction of the motion. Then the angle alpha between the velocity vector and a fixed direction remains the same during the motion. If the moving body is traveling equal distances in equal time intervals, then the length of the velocity vector is always the same along the trajectory of the motion. Then we can see that the velocity vector of the body is constant during the motion. As a result, the acceleration vector of the moving body is zero. A typical example for the uniform linear motion is a car traveling on a straight highway or road with a constant speed. The engine of the car provides the mechanical power to make the wheels run and keep the vehicle moving forward. At the same time, the running engine also needs to overcome the aerodynamic drag and friction between the tires and the road resisting the forward movement. This example demonstrates the everyday experience that we normally need some external effect to move a body with a constant speed along a straight line. However, if we leave our everyday environment in Earth and study the motion of objects in space, then we see that the uniform linear motion is a natural state of bodies. When an astronaut pushes a small object in space, the body moves with a constant speed along a straight line until it collides with the wall of the spacecraft. Now, let us derive the equations of motion in the case of a uniform linear motion. We have already concluded that the acceleration of a body traveling along a straight line with a constant speed vanishes. That is, the acceleration A of the body is the zero vector. By integrating of the zero acceleration, we obtain that the velocity of the body is a constant of the integration. 
Let us denote the constant velocity with the vector v0. If we integrate the constant velocity v0 then we obtain the position vector of the body. The result will be the velocity vector v0 times the time t, plus a constant vector of integration, let us say r0. The position vector r0 is the starting position of the body at the time t equal to 0. As time goes by, the body is leaving the starting position r0 and moving in the direction of the velocity vector v0. The distance s covered by the body during its motion is just the magnitude of the difference between the position vector r and the starting position r0. Then the distance is equal to the length of the vector v0 times the time t, minus the length of r0. It is convenient to apply the Cartesian or rectilinear coordinate system when we want to derive of the equations of motion for the uniform linear motion. First we choose the surface on which the body moves as the frame of reference and we attach the coordinate system to it. Then we align the x-axis of the coordinate system with the direction of the motion and describe the position of the body with the coordinate x. The initial position of the body can also be chosen as the origin of the x-axis but we consider the general case where the body is in the point x0 at the time t equal to 0. Then the vector equations of motions reduce to the scalar equations for the x component of the kinematic quantities. As a result, the equations of motions in Cartesian coordinates are the following. Since the acceleration vector of the moving body is zero, each of its components vanishes. Then the x component ax of the acceleration is equal to zero. The y and z components of the velocity v of the moving body vanish, and its x component vx is equal to the constant v0. By virtue of the choice of the coordinate system, the x-axis points to the direction of the velocity of the moving body. The y and z components of the position vector are of the moving body vanish, and the x component is equal to v0 times t, plus x0. That is, the body travels in the along the x-axis from the initial point x0. The distance s covered by the moving body is equal to the difference between its instantaneous position x and its initial position x0. Now we show the graph of the velocity v of the body versus the time t. The body moves with the constant speed v0, which is plotted with a horizontal blue line at the value v0 on the ordinate. Since the distance s covered by the moving body in a given time t is equal to the integral of the speed over the time interval between 0 and t, it is given by the area under the line equal to v0. This area is shaded with green color, and it is equal to v0 times t. We can also plot the distance s as a function of the time t. Since the distance s is equal to v0 times t, we have a straight line running from the origin with the tangent v0, that is the angle alpha between the x-axis and the line is equal to the speed v0, which is the ratio of the distance to the time. If the time t is given on the abscissa, we can read off the value of the distance s from the ordinate with the help of the line representing the velocity in this plot. The next basic motion which we discuss is the free fall. The free fall is a downward vertical motion of bodies under the influence of gravity. Since the free falling objects move along a vertical straight line, we talk about a one dimensional motion, as in the case of the uniform linear motion. The only difference between them is that the free fall is not a uniform motion. The everyday experience seems to be in contrast to the statement that the free fall is always a downward vertical motion. By comparing the free fall of a ball and a feather, we will observe differences in their motion. If we drop them from the same height at the same time, then we see that the ball has a downward vertical motion, whereas the feather has a somewhat turbulent one deviating from the straight vertical line. We can also notice that the feather falls much more slowly than the ball does, and the ball hits the ground earlier than the feather does. However, the significant difference between their motion is the consequence of the air resistance. If we carry out the same experiment in vacuum, then we can eliminate the effect of the resistance of the air. By putting the ball and the feather in a glass tube and sucking the air out of the tubes with a pump, we can drop the bodies in vacuum. As a result, both the trajectory and the speed will be the same for the falling ball and feather, and they and reach the bottom of the tube at the same time. Thus we can conclude that, there is no difference between the free fall of the ball and the feather in vacuum. The free fall experiment can be carried out a more systematic way, where the free fall of different objects can be observed and compared to each other. Perhaps the most famous experiment studying the law of free fall is attributed to Galileo Galilei, although there is no account by Galileo himself of it, and it may be regarded as a thought experiment. According to one of his pupil, Galileo performed an experiment on the Leaning Tower of Pisa, from which he dropped two spheres of different masses to demonstrate that they hit the ground at the same time, that is their speed is independent of their mass. In such an experiment, 
we could use any object which is heavy enough to make the air resistance negligible during the free fall of the body. Nowadays, drop towers provide a facility for experiments measuring the law of the free fall or achieving a high quality of microgravity. Here we can see the Bremen drop tower, which is the main laboratory of ZARM. The tower has its drop capsule inside a drop tube under vacuum. During an experiment, a capsule is pulled to a height of 120 meters to the top of the tube and then released. After about 5 seconds the capsule lands safely in a deceleration chamber filled up flexible spheres. Under these conditions many measurements can be performed with a high precision. Such experiments can demonstrate that the motion of free-falling bodies is independent of the mass, the shape, the size, the material composition and other properties of the bodies. Then the law of free-fall states that, all objects fall with the same rate in a vacuum. This statement is in contrast with the long-standing view held by Aristotle, who claimed that heavier bodies fall faster than lighter ones do, based on such observations like the turbulent motion of the feather in the air. In his book Discourses, Galileo described a simple experiment with an inclined plane, so that he could make the observation of the moving bodies easier, and draw some conclusions on the law of free fall based on the results of his measurements. His basic assumption was that the motion with changing velocity follows the simplest form in nature, the velocity of the moving objects is changing with the equal amount in every equal time period. That is, the acceleration of a free-falling body is constant. Since any object falls fast enough to make the measurement of the covered distance and the duration difficult, Galileo wanted to decelerate the rapid motion by replacing a falling object with a ball rolling down a ramp. He designed a simple experimental setup with an inclined plane, as seen in the figure. The apparatus consisted of a wooden ramp with a groove cut into it and a bronze ball. When he let the ball roll down the groove he could track its motion started from different heights on the inclined plane, while measuring the time of the arrival of the rolling ball at the bottom of the ramp. The steps of the experiment were the following. Starting with the full length S of the plane, he rolled the ball several times down and measured the elapsed time and calculated the average time T. Then he rolled the ball down from a point so that the motion of the ball covered only a quarter of the full distance S, and measured the elapsed time. He found that its average was equal to the half of T. That is, if the ball travels for two times a given time, then it will cover four times the distance covered during that time. Galileo repeated the experiment by rolling the bronze ball on the plane with a higher inclination angle. When he used the full length S of the ramp, the average of the time during which the ball covered the distance S was T prime. If he reduced the covered distance to the quarter of S, the time average he measured was the half of T prime, as in the case of the ramp with the smaller inclination angle. As a result of the experiment, Galileo demonstrated that the distance which the rolling ball covers in a given time is always proportional to the square of the time. By increasing the inclination angle of the plane, he approached the condition for the free fall of the ball. Then he concluded that the relation measured between the covered distance and the elapsed time must hold in the case of free fall as the limiting case of the steeper and steeper inclination angles. The figure in the right-hand side illustrates this law. The free-falling ball covers one unit of the distance s during one unit of the time t. Then it covers four units of the distance s during two units of the time t. If the elapsed time is three units, then the ball covers the distance of nine units. For the time equal to four units, the ball will reach the point at 16 units of the distance s, and so on. Let us see how Galileo formulated the theory of free fall. As we have seen, his basic assumption was that the free-falling bodies have a constant acceleration, that is their velocity v is proportional to the elapsed time t, where the proportionality factor a is a constant. By virtue of the this proportionality between the velocity and the time, the average velocity of the body for the time interval between the beginning of the free fall and a given time t is simply the half of the velocity v measured at the time t. That is, the average velocity is equal to the half of the acceleration a times the time t. The distance s covered by the falling body from the beginning of the free fall to the time t is given by the product of the average velocity and the time t. If we substitute the expression obtained for the average velocity into this equation, then we get half times the acceleration a times the square of the time t. Then we can see that the ratio of the distance s to the square of the time t is equal to the half of the acceleration, which is constant. This result corresponds to the findings of Galileo's inclined plane experiment. As we have already mentioned, Galileo needed to slow down the rapid motion of the free fall since no precise method was available for the time measurement in the Renaissance Italy. Galileo himself applied a water clock, he let water flow into a vessel while the bronze ball was rolling down on the ramp, 
and measure the weight of the amount of water gathered in the vessel. Nowadays, we can apply more precise methods to measure the relation between the distance and the time in the case of free fall. Here we have a sketch of a simple experimental setup with an electric mini motor attached in a vertical position with its rotation axis to a stand. We can also see a cone-shaped plastic container filled with ink from which the liquid flows into an empty drum with a small hole on it. This apparatus is mounted on the axis of the motor. If we switch the motor on, it will rotate the drum filled with ink. Then the liquid starts to rotate together with the drum and the ink is sprinkled through the hole in the horizontal direction. We can apply a fixed shade with a hole to let the ink propagate only through the hole of the shade. As a result, we obtain a pulsating ink jet in a given direction with a repetition time depending on the operation frequency of the motor. We can adjust this frequency to obtain a given repetition time t of the pulsating jet. For example, let us apply a repetition time of 0.4 seconds. Now we can suspend a slat on a string attached to the stand in the front of the hole of the shade. If we start the motor and cut the string, then the slat falls down while the pulsating ink jet leaves stripes on it. As a result, we obtain a series of ink stripes on the slat and we can measure the distances between them and the first stripe, where the distances between the stripes depend on the repetition time of the ink jet and the velocity of the slat. Then we have a time series of measured distances which can be written in a table. Since the repetition time t of the ink jet can be set precisely by adjusting the electric motor, we only need to carefully measure the distances between the stripes so that we could minimize the measurement errors. The time ti is equal to i times the repetition time t of the ink jet, where the index i is an integer running from 1. Si denotes the distance of the i plus 1 stripe from the first one. Then the first row of the table will contain the elapsed time ti. That is t, 2 times t, ellipsis, i times t and so on. The second row of the table gives the measured distance as si. That is s1, which is the distance between the first stripe and the second one. s2, which is the distance between the first stripe and the third one, and so on. In the last row of the table we compute the ratio of the distance si to the square of the time ti. That is, we have s1 over t1 squared, s2 over t2 squared, and so on. If we compute these ratios in the last row, then we will find that their values scatter around a constant, where the scattering is due to the measurement error. That is, the covered distance s of any point of the free falling slat is proportional to the square of the duration time of the free fall, where c is the proportionality constant. If we want to determine the constant c, that is the ratio of the distance s to the time t squared, we need to choose relative large values for the distance, which mitigates the measurement error. We can use the ratios in the last few columns in the table calculated for the stripes far from the first one. Then the result of the measurement gives approximately 4.905 meter per second squared for the proportionality constant c. That is the instantaneous velocity of the free falling slat is equal about 5 meter per second squared times the duration of the fall. This relation between the covered distance and the duration of the free fall was also demonstrated by Arthur Jules Morin, a French physicist, who constructed an apparatus to record the trajectory of a free-falling body as a graph. The principle of the free-fall apparatus is illustrated in the figure. A falling body is guided by two parallel wires in the front of a large vertical cylinder, both of them installed on a frame. A sheet of paper is wrapped around a rotating cylinder, which is driven by a weight moving downwards on the opposite side. An air vane at the top of the frame also rotates with the cylinder and causes it to revolve at a constant angular velocity. An inked brush is attached to the body and marks its position on the sheet rotating with the cylinder. As a result, we obtain a diagonal trace of the falling body along the moving surface of the cylinder. The motion of the falling body can be analyzed if the sheet is removed from the cylinder and laid out flat. The vertical direction in the sheet corresponds to the instantaneous position of the body, whereas the length measured in the horizontal direction is proportional to the elapsed time. The curve drawn on it is one half of a parabola which opens downward and can be interpreted as the graph of a distance covered by the falling body versus the duration of the free fall. Then the graph shows that the covered distance as a function of time is a parabola, that is s is equal to the constant c times the square of the time t. The value of this constant is already determined in the previous experiment. We can substitute this relation into the definition of the velocity and write its magnitude, that is the speed, as the derivative of the distance s with respect to the time t. The derivative of the function c times t squared is equal to 2c times t. That is the speed of the falling body is proportional to the time. Now, we can insert this result into the definition of the acceleration. 
The length of the acceleration vector is the derivative of the speed with respect to the time, that is the derivative of 2 times c times t. This gives 2 times c, which is constant, as we expected. Then we can conclude that the acceleration of any free-falling body is constant in time, and it is called gravitational acceleration. It is denoted by the letter g, and its value is 2 times c that is 9.81 meter per second squared. Based on the results of the experiments presented here, we can now formulate the laws of motion for free fall. The distance s covered by a free falling body in a time interval t is given by the half of the gravitational acceleration g times the square of the elapsed time t. This relation is illustrated in the figure in the right hand side, which was already shown in the discussion of the inclined plane experiment. If the falling ball covers a unit distance during the unit time, it will cover 4 units of distance during 2 units of time. Then it will cover 9 units of distance during 3 units of time, and so on. The instantaneous velocity v of a free-falling body is directly proportional to the time t, where the proportionality constant is the gravitational acceleration g. That is, the acceleration of the free-falling body is constant and equal to 9.81 meter per second squared, which we call the gravitational acceleration g. We can also express the elapsed time of the free fall form the first formula. Then we obtain that the time t needed to cover the distance s by a free falling body is given by the square root of the 2 times the distance s over the gravitational acceleration g. If we eliminate the time from this formula by applying the second equation for the velocity, we can determine the instantaneous velocity v of the free falling body when it covered the distance s. Its value is equal to the square root of 2 times the gravitational acceleration g times the distance s. We note that all the experiments presented here demonstrated the laws of motion of the free fall only locally. If these experiments take place anywhere on Earth, then we will find these laws of motion remain valid. There is only one issue which has to be taken into account for precise numerical computations. The value of the gravitational acceleration depends on the latitude and the height above sea level. The variation of the gravitational acceleration is due to several effects, such as the shape and the rotation of the Earth, which we will study in dynamics. The gravity of Earth as a function of the latitude and the height is called the normal gravity. If we consider the measurements performed at sea level, its value is 9.78 meter per second squared at the equator, and 9.832 meter per second squared at the poles. In horizontal direction its value decreases by about 3 times 10 to the minus 6 meter per second square as long as the elevation is small against the Earth radius. Its average value is equal to 9.80665 meter per second squared. Besides the global variation of the gravitational acceleration there are also gravity anomalies, which describe how much the actual gravity of Earth differs from the normal gravity due to the local geographic features of the Earth's surface, such as the presence of big land masses and ocean trenches. The normal gravity and the gravity anomalies were extensively measured throughout the planet, and many gravity anomaly map are available providing a global coverage on the Earth's gravity field. Here, such a colorized anomaly map shows the local deviations of the acceleration, measured in millimeter per second squared. The unit centimeter per second squared is named after Galilei, and these maps normally use milli-Galilei. However, in many cases we can use a local approximation of the laws of motion for the free fall, where we assume that the vector g of the gravitational acceleration is constant. That is, the acceleration vector always points downward and its magnitude is constant, namely 9.81 meter per second squared. Simple harmonic motion is a special case of periodic motion in kinematics. We talk about periodic motion, if a moving body repeats its path in equal intervals of time. In the case of simple harmonic motion, a body performs a repeated back and forth movement over the same path about an equilibrium position. The maximum displacements of the body on the opposite sides of its equilibrium position are equal. This repeating motion with an equilibrium position between two turning points is also called harmonic oscillation. The trajectory of a body covers a complete cycle of the oscillation, if it leaves its equilibrium position, reaches one of its maxima, returns to its equilibrium position, leaves it in the opposite direction, reaches its other maximum, and returns to its equilibrium position again. There are many examples for such a type of motion in our everyday environment. A well-known example is the pendulum clock where the pendulum performs a periodic motion. The bob on the end of the pendulum swings back and forth along an arc. It follows the same path in each period, the vertical position in its equilibrium and the two turning points on the opposite sides of the equilibrium position. If we project the motion of the bob on a horizontal line, 
then its horizontal position performs a harmonic oscillation along the line. Another example for harmonic motion is the group of waves on the water surface. The propagating waves repeat themselves for several cycles and are associated with simple harmonic motion. However, in a strict sense we have to speak of damped harmonic motion since the waves die out quickly. Sound, for example produced by musical instruments, is also a form of the harmonic motion, where the vibrations of the air propagates in every direction, and their damping is not so drastic as in the case of the waves on the water surface. The classical example for such a type of motion is the motion of a spring. If we stretch or compress a spring with one end fixed, then it starts oscillating. Its oscillating end performs a one-dimensional motion around its equilibrium position, which provides a convenient method to study simple harmonic motion. A spring oscillator consists of a spring, fixed with one end, and a body attached to its other one. Here we can see an apparatus with a vertical spring attached to a weight sliding on a guide rail. The displacement of the weight along the axis of the spring can be measured with a ruler. Let us start with the main property of the equations of motion for simple harmonic motion. If the position vector of the body performing harmonic oscillation is given, then the velocity of the body can be obtained by differentiating it with respect to time, and its second-order derivative is equal to the acceleration of the body. Since the simple harmonic motion is periodic, the position vector r of the body at the time t is the same as the one at the time t plus the period of the harmonic oscillation, denoted with the capital letter t. If a function is periodic, then its first and second order time derivatives are also periodic functions. That is, both the velocity and the acceleration of an oscillating body are periodic with the same period t. As a result, it is enough to study the motion during one cycle of the oscillation since a complete cycle provides all the relevant information on the nature of the motion. Based on these statements, let us provide a graphic description of the harmonic motion. We can use the spring oscillator to produce the graph of the motion for an oscillating body. Here we can see a ball suspended on a spring, which is attached on the ceiling. By pulling the ball in the vertical direction, we stretch the string. If we release the ball then it start oscillating with the displacement x measured from its equilibrium position. We call this displacement the amplitude of the harmonic motion. The simple harmonic motion can be studied by using a double spring oscillator with a ball. Here we attached an inked brush to the ball and placed a sheet of paper under the oscillator, so that we can plot the motion of the body on the sheet. If we pull the ball in one direction along the axis of the springs and release it, then the body starts oscillating. At the same time, we can move the sheet with a uniform speed in the direction perpendicular to the harmonic motion of the ball. Then the motion of the ball consists of two kinds of motion relative to the sheet, which are superimposed to each other. The first one is the harmonic motion of the ball along the axis of the springs, and the second one is the uniform linear motion of the ball perpendicular to the direction of the harmonic motion. As a result, the brush attached to the oscillating body draws a wavy curve on the moving sheet. Since we move the sheet with a uniform speed, the length measured in the direction of its motion is proportional to the elapsed time. The wavy curve plotted on the paper starts from the origin O and passes through the points denoted with capital letters, covering the complete cycle of the motion. In fact, it is a graph of the sine function, and this graph can be interpreted as the amplitude versus time graph of the harmonic motion performed by the ball. The period of the oscillation is t, and its maximal amplitude is denoted with x0. The initial time is chosen such that the ball passes through its equilibrium position at the origin O and moves into the positive direction. Then it reaches the maximum value x0 in the point A, and returns to its equilibrium position in the point B. It passes through its equilibrium position, moves in the negative direction and reaches the maximum amplitude of minus x0 in the point C. In end of the cycle it returns to its equilibrium position in the point D. The oscillating ball repeats this cycle with the period t again and again. Since the sine function has a period of 2 pi, the amplitude x is given by x0 times the sine of the ratio of 2 pi times the time t to the period of the oscillation. This equation describes the simple harmonic or sinusoidal motion. We will give the following interpretation of the harmonic motion. Let us consider a point mass p moving along a circle of the radius x0 with a constant speed. We chose the center O of the circle as a frame of reference, and we attach an axis of the polar coordinate system to it so that the axis coincides with the time axis of the sinusoidal curve shown in the right-hand side. Then the x-axis of the displacement of the harmonic motion will be perpendicular to the axis of the polar coordinate system. We describe the position of the point P on the circle with the phase angle phi, measured from the axis of the polar coordinate system. 
we can project the motion of the point mass onto the x-axis and the plane of the circle. Then we will see that the projected point performs a simple harmonic oscillation around the equilibrium point O along the x-axis with the maximal amplitude x0. Since the phase angle of the radius op is equal to 2 pi for a complete rotation along the circle, phi is proportional to the time of the rotation with the proportionality constant 2 pi divided by the period of the cycle. That is, phi is equal to the ratio of 2 pi times the time t to the period of the cycle. The projection x of the radius op on the axis of the displacement is given by x0 times sine phi, which is equal to x0 times the sine of 2 pi times t over the time period, as we have already seen it. As in the case of the motion of the pendulum projected onto a vertical axis, the projection of motion of a ball attached to a rotating disc is harmonic motion. We can compare this motion with the oscillation of a ball suspended on a spring in the plane of the disc. By finding the proper speed for the rotation of the disc, the motion of the ball attached to it will coincide with the one of the ball oscillating on the string. In the graph of the amplitude versus the elapsed time we measure the time from the equilibrium position of the oscillating body. If the amplitude of the oscillation is arbitrary at the initial condition t equal to zero, then the general form of the amplitude x is given by x0 times sine 2 pi over the period times the time t plus an angle alpha. Here we used a phase constant alpha to shift the sine function along the time axis with angle alpha. At the time t equal to zero, the amplitude x of the harmonic motion is equal to x0 times sine alpha. For alpha equal to half of pi, the amplitude x becomes the maximal amplitude x0 at the time t equal to zero. Then we conclude that the amplitude x of the oscillation is given by x0 time cosine 2 pi over the period times the time t, which is completely equivalent with the original form of the amplitude as a function of time, apart from a phase shift of 90 degrees. Although the phase of the harmonic motion depends on the phase constant alpha, it does not change the nature of the motion. It only determines when the time measurement is started during the oscillation. Then alpha can be arbitrary for simple harmonic motion, and it will be chosen as zero without loss of generality. In one cycle of the oscillation the phase angle phi runs from 0 to 360 degrees, and its different values represent different states of motion. Although for phi equal to 30 degrees and 150 degrees the amplitude x is the same, the body in the instantaneous moments represented by these phase angles moves in opposite directions. That is, the velocity of the body is different, which means it has different states of motion at the same location but with different phase angles or at different times. Now we introduce some quantities describing harmonic motion, which are equivalent to each other. We define the frequency nu of the oscillation as the reciprocal of its period t. Then it is measured in the reciprocal of second, and its unit is named after Hertz with the abbreviation hz. The angular frequency omega of the harmonic motion is defined by 2 pi times the frequency nu, that is, 2 pi over the period t, and it is also measured in Hertz. The equation of motion of harmonic motion contains two parameters, its maximal amplitude x0 and its period t. Now we have two other quantities, the frequency nu and the angular frequency omega to describe the periodicity of the oscillation. Depending on which of the parameters are used in the equation, we can write it in three different but equivalent forms. In the original form of the equation of motion we use the period t of the oscillation, where the amplitude x is equal to the maximal amplitude x0 times sine 2 pi divided by the period of the oscillation, times the time t. If we apply the angular frequency omega instead of the period t, then we obtain the simplest mathematical form of the amplitude x, which is given by x0 times sine the angular frequency omega times the time t. We can also use the frequency nu in the equation of the amplitude x, which is then equal to x0 times sine 2 pi times the frequency nu times the time t. After having determined the first equation of motion for the amplitude of the harmonic motion, let us derive the other two equations for the velocity and the acceleration of an oscillating body. As we have already demonstrated, the amplitude x of the oscillation is given by the maximal amplitude x0 times sine 2 pi over the period of the oscillation, times the time t. If we use the angular frequency omega, then we can write the displacement as x0 times sine omega times t. We note that the phase of oscillation is given by 2 pi divided by the period times the time t, or omega times t. The amplitude of oscillation as a function of time is plotted in the right-hand side. Here the vertical dashed lines divide the complete cycle into four equal time intervals with the length of a quarter of the period t. The velocity of an oscillating body is the derivative of the amplitude x with respect to the time t. This gives 2 pi divided by the period t times x0, 
times cosine 2 pi divided by the period times the time t. We can substitute the angular frequency in this equation, and we obtain omega times x0, times cosine omega times t. If we compare the velocity versus time diagram with the graph of the amplitude versus time, we see that its graph is shifted with a 90 degrees in the negative direction along the time axis. The maximal value of the velocity is given by the angular frequency omega times the maximal amplitude x0. As in the case of the displacement x, the velocity function can also be represented by a vector revolving in a circle, but with the radius omega times x0 instead of x0. Here the magnitude of the velocity is given by the vertical projection of the vector, which is equal to omega times x0, times cosine phi. The phase angle phi of the vector is equal to 2 pi over the period times the time t, or omega times t. We can see in the figure, if the phase angle is equal to 0, 180, and 360 degrees, then the vertical projection of the rotating vector is maximal, that is omega times x0. For phi equal to 90 and 270 degrees, the vertical projection of the rotating vector vanishes. In this table, the velocity of the oscillating body is given at the time of 0, at 1 quarter of the period, at the middle of the period, at 3rd quarter of the period, and at the end of the period. At t equal to 0, measured from the moment when the body passes through the equilibrium point, the velocity is maximal with the value of omega times x0. At one quarter of the cycle, where the body reaches the turning point at the maximal amplitude at x0, its velocity reduces to zero. In the middle of the period, the body passes through the equilibrium position again, and the velocity is equal to minus omega times x0. That is, it has a maximum magnitude but points into the negative direction. At third quarter of the period, the body arrives at the turning point with the maximal amplitude of x0 in the negative direction, and its velocity is zero. At the end of the cycle, the body goes back to its equilibrium position again with the maximal velocity omega times x0, pointing into the positive direction. Similarly, we can determine the acceleration of the oscillating body by differentiating the velocity with respect to the time t. We obtain minus the square of 2 pi over the period, times x0 times sine 2 pi over the period. This result can be written as minus omega squared times x0, times sine omega times t. The plot of the acceleration versus time is shifted with 180 degrees in the negative direction of the time axis with respect to the graph of the amplitude versus time. Its maximal value is given by omega 2 times x0. The acceleration can also be represented with a vector rotating around a circle. Here the radius of the circle is equal to omega squared times x0. The acceleration is given by the minus horizontal projection of the vector, which is equal to minus omega squared times x0 times sine phi. Since the phase angle phi is equal to 2 pi over the period times the time t, or omega times t, we regain the equations for the acceleration shown in the left-hand side. In the table, we can see the value of the acceleration at each quarter of the complete cycle. At the beginning of the period, the body passes through the equilibrium point, where its acceleration is zero. At one quarter of the cycle, the body arrives at the turning point x0, where its acceleration has minus omega squared x0. The negative acceleration of a body is called deceleration. Thus the deceleration of the body is maximal in this point. In the middle of the period, the body passes through the equilibrium position again, and its acceleration vanishes. At third quarter of the cycle, the body reaches the turning point at the maximal amplitude of x0 in the negative direction where its acceleration has the maximal value of omega squared times x0. At the end of the period, the body goes back to its equilibrium position again, and its acceleration vanishes. If we compare the equations of motion or the graphs for the amplitude and the acceleration of harmonic motion, then we see that the acceleration can be expressed as minus 2 pi over the period times the amplitude x, or as minus the angular velocity omega squared times the amplitude x. That is the acceleration of an oscillator is proportional to its amplitude, where the proportionality factor is minus omega squared. Then we can conclude the following. If a body is undergoing simple harmonic motion, then the acceleration of the body is directly proportional to its displacement measured from the equilibrium position, and it is always directed towards the equilibrium position. The converse of the statement is also true. If the acceleration of a body moving along a straight line is directly proportional to the distance measured from a fixed point, and it is always directed towards that point, that is, if the acceleration of the body is equal to minus gamma times the distance x of the body from the fixed point, where gamma is a positive constant, then the body is undergoing simple harmonic motion with the period of 2 pi divided by the square root of gamma. 
The period T of the oscillation can be determined by the comparison of the mathematical form and the relation between the amplitude and the acceleration for simple harmonic motion, stating the acceleration is equal to minus 2 pi over the period T squared times the amplitude X. Then we obtain that the square of 2 pi over the period T is equal to gamma. We can solve this equation for the period T, which gives the ratio of 2 pi to the square root of gamma. In this figure, we illustrate the relation between the amplitude and the acceleration of a spring oscillator with the maximal amplitude x0 and the angular frequency omega. Here we follow the motion of the oscillating body from its turning point at the displacement minus x0 to the turning point at x0. This motion is indicated with the green arrow pointing in the positive direction of the x-axis. In the position minus x0, the distance of the oscillating body from its equilibrium position is maximal and its acceleration also has the maximum value of omega squared times x0. Here the body reverses its direction of motion, and starts to move in the direction of its equilibrium position. Therefore its acceleration vector points in the direction of motion, indicated with the upper red arrow. When the body passes through its equilibrium position and move away from it, the acceleration vector reverses its direction and points in the opposite to direction of motion, indicated in the lower red arrow. In the lower figure, we follow the motion of the body from the turning point at the position of x0 to the turning point at minus x0, which is indicated with the green arrow. In the position x0, the distance of the oscillating body from its equilibrium position is maximal. Its acceleration has the value of minus omega squared times x0, that is its deceleration is also maximal. Here the body reverses its direction of motion and starts to move in the direction of its equilibrium position. Then its acceleration vector points in the direction of motion, indicated with the lower red arrow. When the body passes through its equilibrium position and move away from it, the acceleration vector reverses its direction and points in the opposite direction of the motion, indicated in the upper red arrow. Periodic motion can be described with complex numbers in physics, which provides a convenient representation for simple harmonic motion. Complex numbers are ordered pairs of real numbers, that is a complex number z is given by the pair a and b, where a and b are real numbers. The first member a of the pair is called the real part of the complex number z, and the second member b is its imaginary part. We can represent the complex number z with a vector in the complex plane spanned by the axes of the pure real and the pure imaginary numbers. Here the projection of the vector on the real axis gives the real part a of the complex number z and its projection on the imaginary axis gives its imaginary part b. The set C of complex numbers forms a field under the operations of addition and multiplication defined on complex numbers. The addition of two complex numbers, let us say AB and CD, gives another complex number with the real part of A plus C, and with the imaginary part of B plus D. The multiplication of two complex numbers is defined as follows. If we multiply the complex numbers AB and CD with each other, the real part of the result is equal to a times c minus b times d, and its imaginary part is given by a times d plus b times c. In the complex plane there are two units, the pair 1 0 is the real unit, and the pair 0 1 is the imaginary unit. The later one is denoted with i. If we multiply the real unit with itself by using the definition of the complex multiplication, where a and c are 1 and b and d are 0, then we obtain the real unit, that is the square of 1 is 1, as we expected. However, if we multiply the imaginary unit with itself, that is, if a and c are 0 and b and d are 1, we obtain minus 1 0. As a result, the square of the imaginary unit i is equal to minus 1. This is an interesting result. It shows that, if the vector representing the imaginary unit, which points in the positive direction of the imaginary axis, is multiplied with itself, then the resulting vector with the same length points into the direction of the negative real axis. That is, we rotated the imaginary unit 90 degrees counterclockwise by multiplying it with itself. If we multiply the complex number AB with the imaginary unit I, we obtain minus BA, which is the result of the rotation of 90 degrees counterclockwise. By applying the imaginary unit I, we can write any complex number in algebraic form, that is a complex number Z given by the ordered pair AB, can be written as A plus I times B. If we use trigonometric relations in the complex plane, then we can write the projections of any vector representing a complex number in terms of the length of the vector and the angle between the vector and the real axis. Here the length r of the complex number AB is equal to the square root of A squared plus B squared, and the angle phi is given by the tangent of B over A. Then the trigonometric form of Z equal to AB, 
is given by r times the sum of cosine phi and i times sine phi. Since Euler's formula states that cosine phi plus i times sine phi is equal to the exponential of i times phi, we can write the trigonometric form of a complex number in the exponential one, that is r times e to i times phi. This is the most convenient form of complex numbers. The exponential form of the imaginary unit i is simply e to i times pi over 2. If we multiply a complex number z having the magnitude r and angle phi by the imaginary unit i, then we obtain r times e to phi plus pi over 2, as a result of the complex rotation by 90 degrees. We have represented simple harmonic motion with uniform circular motion, where we used vectors revolving in circles. The radii of the circles were equal to the maxima of the kinematic quantities, and the rotation of these vectors represented the change of the kinematic quantities in time. Here we can see a rotating vector in the circle of the radius x0, which is the maximum amplitude of the oscillation. The green vector represents the displacement vector, and its projection on the x-axis is equal to the amplitude x. Its instantaneous direction is determined by the phase angle phi, which is equal to the angular frequency omega times the time t. The next circle has a radius of omega times x0, which is the maximal speed of the oscillating body. The blue vector represents its velocity, which is perpendicular to the vector representing the displacement. The magnitude of the velocity is given by the projection of this vector onto the x-axis. The third circle has the radius of omega squared times x0, which is the maximal acceleration of the oscillating body. The red vector represents the acceleration, and it points in the direction opposite to the direction of the displacement vector. Its projection on the x-axis gives the magnitude of the acceleration. All the three vectors revolve around the circles with the angular velocity omega, and their projections determine the instantaneous kinematic quantities of simple harmonic motion. The plane of these circles can be interpreted as the complex plane with the real and imaginary axes. Then we consider the rotating vectors as the representation of complex numbers, and we use these complex numbers to describe the kinematic quantities. The real part of these complex numbers gives the magnitude of the corresponding kinematic quantity. Then the displacement x of the oscillation can be interpreted as a complex number, which is written in exponential form. Its magnitude is the maximum amplitude x0, and its exponential term is given by e to i times the phase angle phi. The phase angle of the rotating vector is equal to omega times t plus alpha. If the phase angle alpha is set to 0, then x is equal to x0 times e to i times omega times t. The velocity and the acceleration can also be written as such a form. As a result, the complex representation of the equations of motion for simple harmonic motion is the following. The displacement or amplitude is given by the maximum amplitude x0 times e2, i times the angular frequency omega times the time t. The derivative of this equation with respect to the time t gives the velocity of the oscillating body. Then the velocity is equal to i omega times x0, times e to i times omega times t. We saw that the multiplication of a complex number with the imaginary unit is equivalent with the rotation by 90 degrees. Then the velocity can be written as omega times x0 times e to i times phase angle shifted with pi over 2, that is omega times t plus pi over 2. This indicates that the velocity in the harmonic motion is shifted with 90 degrees relative to the one of the amplitude x, as seen in the figure. The derivative of the velocity with respect to the time t is equal to the acceleration of the oscillating body. As a result, the acceleration is equal to the square of i times omega squared times x0 times the exponential factor, where the square of the imaginary unit is minus 1. Then the acceleration is given by minus omega squared times x0 times e to i times omega times t. The multiplication with i squared is equivalent with the rotation of a vector by 180 degrees in the complex plane. Therefore the direction of the vector representing the acceleration is just the opposite to the one of the vector representing the displacement. These equations give the complex representation of the equations of motion for simple harmonic motion. We say that these are the equations of motions of the oscillation in the frequency domain. If we take the real parts of these equations, we obtain the equations of motion in the time domain for simple harmonic motion. Then the equation of motion of the amplitude of the oscillation is equal to x0 times cosine omega t. The velocity of oscillating body is given by omega times x0 times sine omega t, and the acceleration can be written as minus omega squared times x0 times cosine omega t. If we compare these equations with the equations of motions we presented earlier, then we see that they are shifted by a phase constant of 90 degrees with respect to the original ones. However, the phase constant has no importance in the kinetic description of simple harmonic motion. 
Therefore, these equations of motion represent the same type of motion. Let us finish the discussion about simple harmonic motion with the summary of its equations of motion. First, we give an overview of the equations of motion in the time domain. We saw that the simple harmonic motion is described with two parameters. The maximum amplitude x0 of the oscillation and another parameter, which can be the period t of a complete cycle, the frequency nu, or the angular frequency omega of the periodic motion. If we consider the choice of the second parameter, then we can arrange the different forms of the equations of motion in a table with the columns for the amplitude, the velocity, the acceleration of the moving body, and the parameters used in these equations. We start with the parameters x0 and omega, since the application of the angular frequency provides the simplest and the most popular form of the equations of motion for simple harmonic motion. The amplitude x of the simple harmonic motion is equal to the maximal amplitude x0 times the sine of the angular frequency omega times the time t. The velocity vx of the oscillating body is given by omega times x0 times cosine omega times t, and its acceleration ax can be written as minus omega squared times x0 times sine omega times t. We can use the frequency nu of the oscillation instead of the angular frequency omega. Then we obtain the equations of motion in the following form, where we replaced omega with 2 pi nu in each equation. In the original form of the equations of motion we use the period t of the cycle as the second parameter. Then we obtain these equations from the equations in the, the third line of the table by substituting the frequency nu with the reciprocal of the period t. An alternative form of these equations can be used if we apply a phase constant of 90 degrees, that is if we start measuring the time a quarter of a period later than we did for the equations in the table. As a result of this phase shift, we need to replace the function sine with cosine and vice versa in these equations. Therefore, the amplitude and the accelerations are functions of cosine omega t now and the velocity depends on sine omega t. These equations can also be written in terms of the frequency nu or the period t. Second, we also show the table for the equations of motion in the frequency domain. If we use the parameters x0 and omega, the complex representation of the amplitude of simple harmonic motion can be written as x0 times e to i times omega t. The complex representation of the velocity of the oscillating body is given by i times omega times x0 times e to i times omega t, whereas the complex representation of the acceleration is equal to minus omega squared times x0 times e to i times omega t. If we use the frequency instead of the angular frequency, then we just need to replace omega with 2 pi times nu in these equations. Similarly, for the period t, we have the following equations for the kinematic quantities, where we have substituted 1 over t into nu. These are the equations of motion for simple harmonic motion with different sets of parameters, represented in the time and frequency domain. We have already studied the motion of a body under the influence of gravity in the case of free fall. Now we present a similar type of motion, the motion of projectiles. Projectile motion is the motion of a body thrown or projected into the air under the influence of gravity. The body undergoing such a motion is called projectile. Let us consider some examples for projectile motion. The first one is the simplest example, the motion of a stone thrown by hand. If we throw a stone away, then it will only be subject to acceleration as a result of gravity. The next example is the moving projectile of a cannon, which is one of the most effective apparatus to launch projectiles. Typical long-range cannons can reach targets within a couple of hundred kilometers. As opposed to cannons, where the long horizontal range of the projectile is an important factor, Firework projectiles are launched to higher altitudes, where they explode away, and the portions of the shell fall back to the ground as burning debris. Another typical example for the phenomenon of projectile motion is a water fountain, where the stream of water follows the trajectory of the projected water. In many cases, we also need to take into account the fact that the air resistance modifies the trajectory of the projectile. Since the resistance of the air depends on the shape of the projectile, Different projectiles launched with the same thrust in the same direction will cover different trajectories. Therefore the air resistance makes the motion more complicated, and it is practical to neglect it in the study of the basic motion of the projectile. Then the motion is completely determined by the gravitational acceleration. The air resistance is completely eliminated if we study the projectile motion in vacuum. However, such experiments can only be performed in vacuum chambers, which are not always available. A simpler solution is a suitable choice of the projectile, so that we could mitigate the effect of the air resistance on the motion. 
If the size of the projectile is negligible, then the air drag acting on the moving body can be reduced. At the same time, the heavier the projectile is, the smaller the effect due to the air resistance will become. That is, in the case of small but heavy projectiles we can neglect the air resistance if the launched objects do not move too fast. Then we apply an idealized model for the projectile, and we regard it as a point mass in the study of its motion. Let us start the discussion with horizontally launched projectiles. The following experiment helps us to understand what happens if we launch a projectile in the horizontal direction. In the experimental setup, a flexible metal plate fixed at its upper edge presses the ball A to a slab, and holds it in a fixed position in the left-hand side of the plate. In the right-hand side of the plate the ball B rests on a ramp. A hammer is suspended in the left-hand side of the plate. This apparatus is placed at a given height above the floor. If we release the hammer, it will strike the plate, which will bend, releasing the ball A, and pushing the ball B left to right in the horizontal direction. As a result, we let the ball A fall down and we launch the ball B horizontally in the right direction at the same time. By performing this experiment, we can demonstrate that the falling and the projected balls will hit the floor in the same time. In order to describe the motion of the balls, we choose the ramp as the reference point O, and attach a two-dimensional Cartesian coordinate system to it. The x-axis of the coordinate system points in the left direction, and the z-axis points downwards. If we choose the equidistant points x1, x2, and x3 along the x-axis, and project them onto the trajectory of the projectile, then we obtain the points p1, p2, and p3. By measuring the vertical coordinate z1, z2, and z3 of these points, we find the following relations between the equidistant x-coordinates and the z-coordinates. By definition, the ratios between the equidistant coordinates are given by the ratios 1, 2, and 3. For the vertical coordinates z1, z2, and z3 we measure the ratios 1, 4, and 9. We can perform this measurement by mounting rings in the positions p1, p2, and p3 on a wall parallel with the xz plane. If the planes of the rings are perpendicular to the direction of the motion of the ball b in the corresponding points, then the projectile can pass through the rings in each point. This result demonstrates that the ratios stated above hold between the vertical and the horizontal coordinates of the trajectory of the projectile. Since the ball A falls freely, its vertical coordinate Z is given by the gravitational acceleration G times the square of the time T divided by 2. Let us consider the moments of the time T1, T2, and T3, when the ball A passes the points Z1, Z2, and Z3 along the Z axis. We can determine the relations between T1, T2, and T3 and the coordinates Z1, Z2, and Z3, by applying the equation of motion for freefall. As a result, the ratios between Z1, Z2, and Z3 are equal to the ratios between T1 squared, T2 squared, and T3 squared. Since the two balls hit the floor at the same time, the ball B needs the same time intervals to cover its path between the points O and P1, O and P2, and O and P3. But we have already seen that the ratios between the coordinates Z1, Z2, and Z3 are given by 1, 4, and 9. That is, the ratios between T1 squared, T2 squared, and T3 squared are equal to the ratios between 1, 4, and 9. This means that the ratios between T1, T2, and T3 are equal to the ratios between 1, 2, and 3. As we have stated, the ball B covers the pass between the points O and P1, O and P2, and O and P3 during these time intervals. That is it covers the vertical distances x1, x2, and x3 during the intervals t1, t2, and t3, respectively. Since the ratios between these time intervals are the same as those of the equidistant coordinates x1, x2, and x3, we can conclude that the vertical distance x covered by the ball b is directly proportional to the elapsed time t. Then we have demonstrated that the motion of a horizontally launched projectile is the composition of a uniform motion along a horizontal line and a vertical free fall. That is, its equations of motion are the following. In the vertical direction, the distance x covered by the projectile is equal to v0 times the time t, where v0 is the initial velocity of the projectile. In the horizontal direction, the distance z covered by the projectile is given by the gravitational acceleration g times the square of the time t divided by 2. If we eliminate the time t from these two equations and solve the result for the coordinate z, then we obtain that the coordinate z is equal to g over 2 times v0 squared times x squared. This is an equation of a parabola located in the xz plane, that is the path of the projectile is a parabola lying in the vertical plane oriented the direction of the launch. 
In the general case of projectile motion, the projectile is launched in an arbitrary direction. Let us suppose that the projectile is launched with the initial velocity v0. That is, the speed and the direction of the launch is determined by the vector v0, where alpha is the angle between the direction of the vector and the horizontal direction. The launched body moves in the vertical plane of v0, and we choose it as the plane of the two-dimensional Cartesian coordinate system. We pick the point of the launch as the reference point O, and we attach the coordinate axes to it, so that the x-axis points in the horizontal direction, and the z-axis points upwards. The initial condition for the projectile t equal to zero is the following. The x and z coordinates of the projectile are zero, and the x and z component of its initial velocity are given by v0 times cosine alpha and v0 times sine alpha, respectively. By generalizing the results of the experiment with the horizontally launched projectile, we claim that the motion is the composition of a uniform linear motion in the direction of the vector v0, and the free fall of the projectile. We can describe the uniform linear motion of the body passing through the equidistant points a1, a2, a3 without free fall in the following table. In the first row, we will show the time elapsed till the projectile would reach any of these points if it had a uniform linear motion in the direction of v0. In the second row, we will write the distances covered during the time intervals given in the first row. The time t1, when the body passes through the point a1, is given by a time interval delta t, which depends on the velocity v0. The distance vector between the points O and A1 is equal to V0 times delta T. At the time T2, the body passes through the point A2. Since we talk about a uniform linear motion, T2 is given by 2 times delta T. Then the distance vector between the points O and A2 is equal to 2 times V0 times delta T. The time T3, at which the body passes through the point A3, is given by 3 times delta t, and the distance vector between the points O and A3 is equal to 3 times V0 times delta t. We could continue this process with further points on the path of the uniform linear motion. The next table shows the covered distances of the body in the case of free fall started from the points A1, A2, and A3 for the same sequence of time. If the body fell freely from the point A1, then it would travel the distance g times delta t squared divided by 2 during the time 1t. Let p1 denote the point with this vertical distance from the point a1, and let s1 denote the distance between a1 and p1. At the time t2, the body freely falling from the point a2 would cover the distance g times the square of 2 times delta t divided by 2. Then the distance between the point a2 and p2 would be given by 4 times s1. If the body fell freely from the point a3, then the distance traveled by the body during the time t3 would be equal to g times the square of 3 times delta t divided by 2. As a result, the distance between the point a3 and p3 is given by 9 times s1. We could continue this table with a sequence of distance time relations for free fall. Now we are able to construct the series of the points p1, p2 and p3 from the composition of the uniform linear motion and the free fall of the projectile. If we translate the vertical distance a1 p1 to the head of the vector o a1, then we obtain the position p1 of projectile at the time t1. Similarly, the translation of the vertical distance a2 p2 to the head of the vector o a2 gives the position p2 of the body at the time t2. The position p3 of the projectile at the time t3 is determined by translating the vertical distance a3 p3 to the head of the vector o a3. In general, if the projectile is in the point p at the time t, then the x component of the position vector op are given by the distance o times cosine alpha, and its z component is equal to o times sine alpha, minus 1 over 2 times g times t squared. Here the length of the position vector oa is simply v0 times the time t. This general case shows that the trajectory of the projectile is a parabola with a vertical axis. Then we conclude that the equations of motion for the projectile launched with the initial velocity v0 are the following. The x component of its position vector is given by the magnitude of v0 times the time t times cosine alpha. And its c component is equal to the magnitude of v0 times the time t times sine alpha, minus 1 over 2 times the gravitational acceleration g times the square of the time t. Now we formulate the composition principle used to determine the displacement of a projectile launched in an arbitrary direction, and we also elaborate its equations of motion. The motion of a projectile launched with the initial velocity v0 is the composition of a linear uniform motion in the direction of v0 and the free fall of the projectile. The equations of motion for the projectile are the following. 
The displacement of the projectile in the horizontal direction is along the x-axis and is given by the magnitude v0 of the initial velocity times the time t, times cosine of the inclination angle alpha of the launch. The vertical displacement z is equal to the magnitude of v0 times the time t times sine alpha, minus 1 over 2 times the gravitational acceleration g times t squared. Here we see that the horizontal displacement is due to the uniform linear motion, whereas the vertical displacement is the composition of the uniform linear motion and the free fall of the projectile. The derivatives of these equations with respect to the time t give the components of the velocity of the projectile. The x component of the velocity is given by v0 times cosine alpha, and its c component is equal to v0 times sine alpha, minus g times t. In the horizontal direction, we have the horizontal component of the initial velocity vector v0. In the vertical direction, we have both the vertical component of the initial velocity and the instantaneous velocity due to the free fall of the projectile. The derivatives of the velocity components of the projectile with respect to the time provide the component of its acceleration. The horizontal component of the acceleration vanishes, since we have only the uniform linear motion in the x direction, while its vertical component is equal to minus the gravitational acceleration g. The minus sign indicates that the z-axis and the gravitational acceleration vector point in the opposite directions. If we eliminate the time t from the component equations of the displacement, we can determine the vertical coordinate z as a function of the horizontal coordinate x. This gives the equation of the projectile's trajectory, which states that z is equal to x times tangent alpha, minus g over 2 times v0 squared times the square of cosine alpha, times x squared. The trajectory equation holds, provided the angle alpha of the launch is not equal to the right angle, that is, the projectile is not launched vertically. As we have already stated, this is an equation of a parabolic trajectory with a vertical axis. This axis determines the maximum height of the parabola. Since at the maximum height of its parabolic trajectory the vertical velocity of the projectile vanishes, we can determine the time required to reach the maximum height h from the equation of the z component of the velocity. If vz vanishes at a given time th, then v0 times sine alpha minus g times th is equal to zero. As a result, we can solve this equation for the time, and we obtain that th is given by the ratio of v0 times sine alpha to g. Now we can substitute the time th into the equation of the trajectory. Then the maximum height h, which is the vertical coordinate z measured at the time t, is equal to v0 times the ratio of v0 times sine alpha to g, times sine alpha, minus 1 over 2 times g times the square of the ratio of v0 times sine alpha to g. This gives v0 squared times the square of sine alpha, divided by 2 times g. Then we see that the greater the initial velocity v0 and the inclination angle alpha of the launch are, the higher the maximum height h of the trajectory of the projectile is. We can also determine other special quantities which characterize the trajectory of the projectile, such as the total time, the range and the maximum distance of the flight. When the projectile hits the ground, its vertical coordinate z vanishes. Then we can apply the equation of the vertical displacement z to determine the total time t tot of the flight of the projectile. The coordinate z measured at the time t tot vanishes, that is v0 times t tot times sine alpha, minus 1 over 2 times g times t tot squared is equal to 0. We can solve this equation for t tot, which gives 2 times v0 times sine alpha, divided by g. This is 2 times the time th needed to reach the maximal height, since the parabolic trajectory is symmetric to the vertical axis at its maximum height. If we substitute the total flight time t tot into the equation of the horizontal coordinate x, we obtain the range of the projectile. The horizontal displacement x measured at the time t tot is given by 2 times v0 squared times sine alpha divided by g, times cosine alpha, which is equal to v0 squared times sine 2 alpha, divided by g. From this result we determine the maximum distance which can be reached by the projectile. For a given magnitude of the initial velocity v0, the projectile reaches the maximum distance if sine 2 alpha is maximal, that is, if sine 2 alpha is equal to 1. Then the angle alpha of the launch must be 45 degrees. In that case, the maximal distance is given by the ratio of v0 squared to g. If the angle of the launch is greater or smaller than 45 degrees, the range of the projectile will be smaller than the maximal distance for a given speed v0 of the launch. We can launch the projectile with a flat trajectory, that is with an inclination angle alpha 1 less than 45 degree, or with steep trajectory under the angle alpha 2 equal to 90 degrees minus alpha 1. Then the range of the projectile is the same for both the flat and the steep trajectories, 
Since sine 2 times alpha 2 is equal to the sine of 180 degrees minus 2 times alpha 1, which is simply sine 2 times alpha 1. That is, the range x of the projectile measured at time t tot is the same for both the ratio v0 squared times sine 2 times alpha 1 to g, and the ratio v0 squared times sine 2 times alpha 2 to g. Thus, we found a pair of trajectories, a flat trajectory and a steep one covering the same range. Let us summarize the equations of motion for projectile motion, and see how we can obtain the equations for the horizontally and vertically launched projectiles as special cases of the projectiles launched in an arbitrary direction. We start with the general case, where the initial velocity of the projectile is equal to v0, and alpha is the angle between the direction of the initial velocity vector and the horizontal direction. One of special cases is the horizontally launched projectile, where the inclination angle alpha of the launch is equal to zero. The other special case we consider here is the vertically launched projectile, where alpha is equal to 90 degrees. In the general case the displacement of the projectile measured from the position of its launch at the duration t is given by the following equations. The horizontal displacement x is completely determined by the horizontal component of the initial velocity, and it is equal to v0 times t times cosine alpha. The vertical displacement z is determined by both the initial velocity vector v0 and the free fall of the projectile, and it is given by v0 times t times sine alpha, minus 1 over 2 times the gravitational acceleration g times t squared. In the case of the horizontally launched projectile, cosine alpha is equal to 1 and sine alpha vanishes. Then the displacement x is given by v0 times t, and the equation of the displacement z reduces to minus 1 over 2 times g times t squared. In the case of the vertically launched projectile, cosine alpha vanishes and sine alpha is equal to 1. As a result, the horizontal displacement x of the projectile is 0, as it must be for a vertically launched body, and the vertical displacement z is equal to v0 times t, minus 1 over 2 times g times t squared. The velocity of the projectile in the general case is the following. Its horizontal component vx is given by v0 times cosine alpha, and its vertical component vz is equal to v0 times sine alpha minus g times t. In the case of the horizontally launched projectile, the horizontal component of the velocity is simply the initial velocity v0, whereas the vertical component vz is given by minus g times t. In the case of the vertically launched projectile, there is no horizontal component of the velocity, that is vx vanishes, and its vertical component vz is equal to the initial velocity v0 minus g times t. The acceleration of the projectile in the general case is very simple. There is no horizontal component of the acceleration, that is x vanishes, and the vertical component az is minus g, that is the gravitational acceleration pointing downwards. Since the acceleration of the projectile does not depend on the inclination angle alpha of its launch, the acceleration is the same in both the special cases, that is for the horizontally launched projectile and the vertically launched one. In the general case, the trajectory of the projectile is given by the vertical coordinate z as a function of the horizontal coordinate x, which states that the coordinate z is equal to x times tangent alpha, minus g over 2 times v0 squared times the square of cosine alpha, times x squared. In the case of the horizontal projection, the trajectory equation reduces to z equal to minus g divided by 2 times v0 squared, times x squared. In the case of the vertical projection, this equation is not applicable, since the vertical coordinate z is not a unique function of the horizontal coordinate x, which remains zero during the motion. We also determine the maximum height h, which can be reached by the projectile in the general case, and it is given by v0 squared times the square of sine alpha divided by 2 times g. The duration th for this distance is equal to v0 times sine alpha over g. This is not applicable for the horizontal projection, since the maximum height of the falling projectile is the point x equal to zero which is the point of the launch. In the case of the vertically launched projectile, the maximal height h is given by v0 squared over 2 times g, and the duration th is equal to v0 divided by g. In the general case, the maximum range covered by the projectile is equal to v0 squared times the sine of 2 times alpha divided by g. The total time measured until the projectile falls back on the ground, is just 2 times the duration th. These formulae cannot be applied for the special cases, since in the case of the horizontally launched projectile, the vertical position always remains under the latitude of the launch at z equal to zero, and in the case of the vertical launch, the projectile always moves along the vertical z-axis. 
Uniform circular motion is one of the basic motions in nature. Uniform circular motion can be described as the motion of a body traveling in a circle with a constant speed. It is a planar motion, where the body regarded as a point mass, travels equal distances along its circular path in equal intervals of time. That is, if the body moves from the point P to the point P' prime along the path of the arc length S, then the distance S covered by the moving point mass along the arc is given by the speed V times the duration T of the travel, where V is constant. We can also see that the body leaving the point P takes a complete circle and arrives at the point P again. Therefore, uniform circular motion is a periodic motion, that is the body takes the same time t to complete each revolution around the circle, where t is the period of the motion. Let us consider some examples for uniform circular motion. A typical example is the rotating wheel of a bicycle or other wheeled vehicles. The moving wheel rotates around its axis, and its every point travels along a circular path. If the speed of the rotation is constant, the circular motion of these points is uniform. The next example is the hammer throw, in which athletes gather momentum in a heavy ball at the end of cable, called hammer, that is to be subsequently thrown. Before the hammer is released, some momentum is imparted to the projectile by whirling within a circle. If the thrower spins the ball up to a high speed, in its last revolution goes around a circle with a constant speed, that is its motion is uniform. A well-known example for such a type of motion is the riding on a Ferris wheel, that is rotating at a constant speed. The passengers sitting on it travel along a circular path and have uniform motion in each ride. An example from nature is the motion of stellar bodies in spiral galaxies. The stars regarded as point masses with respect to radii of such galaxies, orbit the center of the spiral galaxy and maintain a uniform circular motion for millions of years. Uniform circular motion is an accelerating motion. Although the length of the velocity vector is constant, its instantaneous direction is different in each point along the circular path. That is, the magnitudes of the velocities in the point P and P' prime are equal but the directions of the vectors V and V' prime are different. Therefore the acceleration of a body maintaining uniform circular motion does not vanish. Now we determine this acceleration. We will compute both the direction and the magnitude of the acceleration of a point mass traveling on a circle with a radius or around the center O. We start to measure the time t when the body passes through the point P. The velocity vector v of the point mass in the point P is the tangent to the circular path in that point. During the time interval between 0 and delta t, the point mass travels to the point P', prime, where it has the velocity v'. Prime. Let us denote the velocity of the body at the points P and P' prime with the vectors Pa and P'b, prime respectively. The arc length between these points covered by the moving point mass during the time delta t is denoted by delta s. If delta phi is the central angle corresponding the points P and P' prime on the circle, then the delta S is equal to the radius R times the angle delta phi. Now we translate the vector V' prime into the point P and denote it with the vector PC. The difference delta V between the vectors V and V' prime is given by the vector AC. Since the vector PA is perpendicular to the vector OP, and the vector PC is perpendicular to the vector OP' prime, the angle APC is equal to the angle POP, which is delta phi. We also see that the triangle APC is an isosceles triangle, and the angle PAC is equal to 90 degrees minus delta phi divided by 2. If we consider an infinitesimal time interval for the motion, that is if delta t tends to 0, the point P' prime approaches the point P. As a result, delta phi also tends to 0, and the angle PAC approaches the right angle and the difference vector delta v becomes perpendicular to the vector v. Since the acceleration is defined by the derivative of the velocity with respect to the time t, which is the ratio of delta v to delta t with delta t approaching zero, the acceleration of the point mass traveling on the circle is perpendicular to its velocity. Because of its direction, the acceleration of a body moving along a circle at a constant speed is called centripetal acceleration. The magnitude of the difference vector is equal to pa times delta phi, which is the magnitude of v times the angle delta phi. If we substitute the equation obtained for the arc length delta s into this expression, we obtain v times delta s over r. Since the magnitude of the acceleration is just the derivative of the magnitude of v with respect to the time t, it can be written as v over r, times the derivative of the arc length with respect to the time t. The derivative is just the speed v, and we obtain v squared over r. Now, we have determined both the direction and the magnitude of the centripetal acceleration. 
these findings can be summarized in the following statement on centripetal acceleration. The acceleration of a body moving on a circle with a radius r, at a constant speed v, points toward the center of the circle, and its magnitude is given by the square of the speed v divided by the radius r. Uniform circular motion can be described by the vector r rotating around the center o of the circle, while it always points to the instantaneous position p of the body moving on the circle. We denote the position vector r with the letters o p, where we chose the center o of the circle as the reference point of the motion. If we attach a polar coordinate system to the origin, we can measure the arc length along the circle with the azimuthal angle phi, that is the arc length s is equal to the radius r times the angle phi. We can also express the angle phi as the ratio of the arc length s to the radius r. We define the angular velocity omega of the body traveling on the circle as the derivative of the central angle phi with respect to the time t. This quantity describes the angular rate of the rotation of the position vector pointing to the object moving on the circle. The unit of the angular velocity is inverse of time. If we use SI, it is measured in reciprocal second. Since we discuss uniform circular motion here, the angular velocity is constant during the revolution of body along the circle. As a result, angular velocity is simply the ratio of the central angle phi to the time t, during which the position vector r of the moving body rotated through the angle phi. That is, the rotation angle phi is directly proportional to the time, and the proportionality factor is the angular frequency omega. Since the arc length s covered by the moving point mass is equal to the radius r times the central angle phi, for uniform motion we can eliminate the angle from this equation, and we obtain r times omega times t. We have seen that the velocity vector v of the point mass is the tangent to the circle in the point p. Its magnitude, the speed v, is just equal to the arc length s divided by the, the time t, and we can express the speed v as the product of the radius r and the angular frequency omega. As already stated, uniform circular motion is a periodic motion with the period t. Then we can express the angular velocity omega as 2 pi over the period t. We can also introduce the frequency nu of the rotation, which is the reciprocal of the period t. It can be written as the angular frequency omega divided by 2 pi, and it has the same unit as of angular frequency. Finally, we express the centripetal acceleration in the term of the angular frequency as well. We saw that the magnitude of the acceleration is given by v squared over r. Since omega can be written as v divided by r, the acceleration is equal to the speed v times the angular frequency omega. But v is equal to r times omega, and we obtain omega squared times r. We describe circular motion in the polar coordinate system with the center of the circle as the origin of the coordinates. Since the polar coordinates are adapted to the symmetry of the motion, this description provides a straightforward derivation of the equations of motion for a body traveling on a circle. The radial coordinate r is simply the length of the rotating position vector pointing from the center o to the instantaneous position p of the body. The azimuthal angle phi is the central angle measured between the position vector and the x-axis. We already presented the kinematic quantities of any moving point mass in polar coordinates. The components of the position vector of the point mass are the radial coordinate r and the azimuthal angle phi. Both are functions of time. We found that the radial component of the velocity of the point mass is simply r dot, and its angular component is given by r times phi dot. We also derive the components of the acceleration and polar coordinate system. Its radial component is equal to r double dot, minus r times the square of phi dot. Its angular component is given by r times phi double dot, plus 2 times r dot times phi dot. From the kinematic quantities written in polar coordinates we obtain the equations of motion for circular motion, if we apply the condition stating that the length of the position vector is equal to the radius of the circular path, which is constant. As a result, the derivative of the radial coordinate of the position vector with respect to the time vanishes. With this condition, the kinematic quantities reduce to the following set of expressions. For the components of the position or displacement vector of the body we have a constant radial coordinate, which is equal to the radius of its circular path, while its angular coordinate still depends on time. The radial component of the velocity of the body traveling around the circle vanishes, and its azimuthal component remains r times phi dot. Both the components of the acceleration of the body reduce to the following expressions, its radial component is equal to minus r times the square of phi dot, and its angular component is r times phi double dot. These component equations demonstrate that the velocity v of the body is perpendicular to its position vector r. For uniform circular motion, 
we have an additional condition stating that the position vector rotates with a constant velocity around the circle. Therefore, the angular velocity omega, that is the derivative of the azimuthal angle with respect to the time, is constant. As a result, the second order derivative of the azimuthal angle of the position vector vanishes. If we apply this condition we can derive the equations of motions for uniform circular motion. The position of the body is given by the radial coordinate r, which equal to the radius of the circle, and the azimuthal angle phi, which is equal to the angular velocity omega times the time t. The velocity of the body is the following. Its radial component vanishes, while its angular component is equal to the angular velocity omega times the radius r. The acceleration of the body has the following components. Its radial component is given by minus the square of the angular frequency omega times the radius vector r, while its angular component vanishes. These equations demonstrate that the acceleration of the moving body is perpendicular to its velocity. We also see that the position vector and the acceleration are anti-parallel, that is the acceleration points in the opposite direction to the position vector. Therefore, the acceleration always points into the center of the motion, and we can talk about centripetal acceleration. Non-uniform circular motion is a more general form of motion, where the speed of the body is not constant along the circle. Here we can also use the examples mentioned earlier in the case of uniform circular motion. When we speed up a bicycle, its wheels rotate faster and faster. This is also true in the case of hammer throw, where hammer speed follows a generally increasing trend during the throw. Ferris wheels stop when passengers are boarding. Then they start to rotate again and are brought up to their constant operational speed. Since the speed of the body depends on time, its position can be described with the constant radius or of the circular path and the central angle phi, which is an arbitrary function of the time t. Then the angular velocity omega, which is the derivative the of central angle phi with respect to the time, may also depend on time in the general case. If we define the angular acceleration alpha as the derivative of the angular velocity with respect to the time, then the angular acceleration is the second order derivative of the central angle phi with respect to the time. In the general case, we can say that alpha depends on time as well. If alpha is constant, we talk about uniformly accelerating circular motion. In the case on non-uniform circular motion, both the direction and the magnitude of the velocity are changing along the circular path. Therefore, the speed of the traveling point mass will not be necessarily the same in the points P and P prime. Let us denote the speed of the body in the points P and P prime with V and V prime again, where V prime is equal to V plus delta V. The velocity v is represented with the vector pa, and the velocity v prime is represented with the vector p prime d, which is the sum of the vectors p prime b and bd. By using this vector sum, we can decompose the rate of change of velocity into two parts. First, we translate the vector p prime b into the point p, which is equal to the vector pc. Then we construct the difference vector ac of the vectors p prime b and pa, and compute the rate of change of this difference that is the length of p prime b minus p divided by delta t. Here the interval delta t is the elapsed time of travel between the points p and p prime. If delta t tends to zero, this rate approaches the ratio of the square of speed v to the radius r, that is the value of the centripetal acceleration, as in the case of the uniform circular motion. The other rate of change of the velocity is measured in the tangential direction, and is given by the length of vector b d divided by delta t. The length of the vector bd is just the magnitude of delta v. This rate approaches the time derivative of the speed v, if delta t tends to zero, which is the tangential acceleration of the body moving on the circle. As a result, we can state the following. In the case of non-uniform circular motion, the acceleration can be decomposed in radial and tangential directions. The radial acceleration of the body is the centripetal acceleration, which is given by the square of the instantaneous speed v divided by the radius r, times the negative of the position vector r divided by its length. Here the negative of the normalized position vector gives the normal vector pointing from the position of the body toward the center of the circle. The tangential acceleration of the body is equal to the derivative of the speed v with respect to the time t times the normalized velocity vector v, which gives the unit tangent to the circle in the given point. The net acceleration of the body traveling on the circle at a non-uniform speed is the sum of the radial and tangential accelerations at any point of the circle. We have already described the motion and polar coordinates to derive the equations of motion for uniform circular motion. We use the same method to obtain the equations of motion for non-uniform circular motion as well. 
we apply the same polar coordinate system with the center of the circle as the origin of the coordinates. The radial coordinate R is the length of the rotating position vector pointing from the center O to the instantaneous position P of the body. The azimuthal angle phi is the central angle measured between the position vector and the x-axis. The general expressions for the kinematic quantities of any moving point mass in polar coordinates are the same as before. The components of the position vector of the point mass are the radial coordinate R and the azimuthal angle phi, and both are functions of time. The radial component of the velocity of the point mass is equal to R dot, and its angular component is given by R times phi dot. The radial component of the acceleration is equal to R double dot, minus R times the square of phi dot. Its angular component is given by R times phi double dot, plus 2 times R dot times phi dot. For circular motion, we have applied the condition stating that the length of the position vector is equal to the radius of the circular path, which is constant. Then the derivative of the radial coordinate of the position vector with respect to the time vanishes. As a result, we have obtained the following set of expressions. For the components of the position or displacement vector of the body we have a constant radial coordinate, which is equal to the radius of its circular path, while its angular coordinate still depends on time. The radial component of the velocity of the body traveling around the circle vanishes, and its azimuthal component remains or times phi dot. Both the components of the acceleration of the body reduce to the following expressions, its radial component is equal to minus r times the square of phi dot, and its angular component is r times phi double dot. Since the derivative of the angular coordinate phi with respect to the time t is equal to the angular velocity omega, we can summarize the equations of motion in the following forms. The position of the body is given by the radial coordinate r, which is equal to the radius of the circle, and the azimuthal angle phi, which is an arbitrary function of the time t. The velocity of the body is the following. Its radial component vanishes, while its angular component is equal to the angular velocity omega times the radius r, and it is equal to the speed v of the body measured along the circle. The acceleration of the body has the following components. Its radial component is given by minus the square of the angular frequency omega times the radius r, while its angular component is equal to the radius r times the derivative of the angular frequency omega. Since the radial coordinate r of the moving body is constant, this expression is just the derivative of the speed v with respect to the time t, as we expected. These component equations demonstrate that the velocity v of the body is the tangent to the circular path in the point p, that is the velocity of the body is perpendicular to its position vector r. However, the acceleration can be decomposed into two components now, the centripetal acceleration pointing towards the center of the motion, and the tangential acceleration pointing into the direction of the tangent to the circle. The centripetal acceleration is equal to minus the square of the angular velocity times the position vector r. The tangential acceleration is simply the derivative of the speed v with respect to the time times the normalized velocity, which is the unit tangent vector to the circle in the point p. Since the acceleration is the vector sum of the centripetal and the tangential accelerations, it is no longer perpendicular to the velocity, and it is not parallel with the position vector. Elliptic motion is a more general form of motion than circular motion, and it has a more complicated description in kinematics. We talk about elliptic motion, when a body moves in an elliptical orbit. That is the trajectory of the traveling point mass is an ellipse. It is a planar motion but not necessarily a uniform one. In nature or in everyday life we normally meet such types of elliptical motion, where the speed of the traveling body is changing along its path. However, it is a periodic motion, which means that the body takes the same time t to complete each revolution around the ellipse, where t is the period of the motion. Let us consider some examples for elliptical motion. The most famous example for such a type of motion is the planetary motion. The orbits of the planets of our solar system around the Sun are elliptical, and the Sun sits at one of the foci of the elliptic planetary orbits. In fact, many objects or projectiles moving in the gravitational fields of a massive object exhibit such type of motion, provided some conditions hold, as we will see in the course on dynamics. Another famous example is the Bohr-Sommerfeld atomic model, where the orbits of electrons for different states of the electron shell may be both circular and elliptic. These different states or electron orbits are represented with a set of numbers, called quantum numbers. This model was successful in paving the way into the modern study of the structure of atoms, namely quantum mechanics, which replaced the former theories of atomic physics. We can also find examples for elliptic motion in industrial technologies. This type of motion is proven to be useful in the screening process of particle flow. 
Elliptical motion vibrating screens combine the advantages of linear and circular motion screens. Elliptical motion screening machines are driven by two centric main shafts, which generate a swing diameter as in a free running drive. Another synchronized shaft transforms the swing diameter into an ellipse. The big advantage of this method is that machines can work with a very low inclination or with no inclination at all, enabling space-saving horizontal installation and high material throughput. Another industrial application of elliptic motion is the elliptic vibration cutting method, where the workpiece is fed against the vibrating tool along the nominal cutting direction. Some piezoelectric transducers are arranged in a metal block to drive the tool tip to vibrate elliptically. The advantage of this method is that the pulling action applied by the cutting tool can assist to pull chips away from the workpiece and lead to a reverse friction during each cutting cycle, which increases the precision of the process. Like circular motion, elliptical motion is also an accelerating motion. In the general case, both the length and the direction of the velocity of the moving body are changing instantaneously. In any two points P and P' prime of the path of the motion, the velocity vectors V and V' prime point in different directions, and they have different magnitudes. As a result, the acceleration of the body is non-zero throughout the whole elliptical orbit. Let us start the discussion on the kinematics of a body moving on an ellipse with the trajectory equation of the body, called polar equation, since it can be derived from the geometric properties of the plane curve of the trajectory. An ellipse is a closed plane curve with from two fixed points F1 and F2, separated by a distance of 2 times c. Here we can see an ellipse with its center in the origin of the Cartesian coordinate system. The length of its semi-major axis is denoted by A, and the length of its semi-minor axis is equal to B. The eccentricity E of the ellipse is defined by the square root of 1 minus the ratio of B squared to A squared and describes the deviation of the shape of an ellipse from the one of a circle. If the eccentricity vanishes, then the length of the semi-major axis is equal to the one of the semi-minor axis. That is the plane curve is a circle, which shows that the circles belong to a special class of ellipses. The eccentricity can be expressed as the ratio of the distance c of the fixed points from the center to the length a of the semi-major axis. If the point p denotes the instantaneous position of a body moving on the ellipse, then we can measure the distance of the point P from the fixed points or foci of the ellipse. By definition, the sum of the distances, F1P and F2P is equal to 2 times the length A of the semi-major axis of the ellipse. Now we can choose any of the foci as the reference point of the motion. If the choose the fixed point F1, the position vector are pointing to the point P from the point F1 describes the instantaneous position P of the moving body. Here theta is the central angle measured between the major axis and the vector r. The length of the position vector is denoted by r, which is equal to the distance f1p. Then the distance f2p is simply 2 times a minus r. Now we can apply the cosine theorem for the angle theta and the triangle p f1, f2, which tells us that the square of 2 times a minus r is equal to r squared, plus the square of 2 times c, minus 4c times r times cosine theta. By calculating the square of the left-hand side of the equation, we obtain 4 times a squared, minus 4 times a times r, plus r squared. This is equal to r squared, plus 4 times c squared, minus 4 times c times r times cosine theta. The terms r squared cancel out each other on the both sides of the equation, and we can divide the result by 4. Then we obtain that a squared minus a times r is equal to c squared minus c times r times cosine theta. If we regroup the terms in this equation, we see that a squared minus c squared is equal to r times a minus c times cosine theta. Since c can be written as the product of a times e, we also see that a squared times 1 minus e squared is equal to a times r times 1 minus e times cosine theta. We solve this equation for r, which gives the distance r of the point p from the focal point f1 as a function of the angle theta. This function is called the polar equation, and states that the distance r is equal to a times 1 minus the square of e, divided by 1 minus e times cosine theta. If we measure the distance of the point p from the focal point f2, the angle theta prime we use in the cosine theorem is measured at the corner f1, f2, p, and it is equal to 180 degrees minus theta, or pi minus theta measured in radians. Then we can write that the square of 2a minus r is equal to r squared, plus the square of 2 times c, minus 4c times r times the cosine of pi minus theta. Since the cosine of pi minus theta is equal to minus cosine theta, we can substitute it in the last term in the right-hand side. This only changes the sign of the last term, therefore the polar equation can be written the following form. 
the distance R is equal to A times 1 minus E squared divided by 1 plus E times cosine theta. Then the general form of the polar equation states that, the distance R of the position P of the moving body from any of the foci is a function of the angle theta, and it is given by A times 1 minus E squared divided 1 minus plus E times cosine theta. If the distance of the moving body is measured from the fixed point F1, then we use the minus sign in the equation. If it is measured from the fixed point F2, we use the plus sign. As already mentioned, the examples of elliptic motion taken from our everyday experience and nature show, that a body traveling along an elliptic path generally does not have uniform motion. Neither its speed nor its angular velocity is constant along its orbit. However, there is one special criterion, which holds in many cases of elliptical motion. The conservation of the aerial velocity of the body. In order to understand the concept of aerial velocity of moving bodies, let us determine it in a mathematical form. Aerial velocity of a point mass is defined by the area swept out by the position vector of the point mass per unit time. We will illustrate what this quantity means in the case of elliptical motion. Here we see an ellipse with the foci F1 and F2. Let us choose the fixed point F1 as the reference point of motion. If the instantaneous position of the body is at the point P at the time T, then the position vector RT of the body points to the location P from the fixed point F1. At the time T plus delta T, the moving point mass reaches the point P prime. Its position vector is RT plus delta T. During the time interval delta T, the position vector of the body sweeps out the area within the ellipse enclosed by the vectors RT and RT plus delta T. Let us compute this area. The two vectors define the parallelogram F2, P, Q, P prime, and we can compute its vector area by taking the vector product of the two vectors. That is, the vector area A of the parallelogram is equal to the cross product of RT times RT plus delta T. The direction of the vector area is simply perpendicular to the plane of the ellipse in which the two vectors lie. Then the vector area of triangle F2, P, P prime is the half of the one of the parallelogram. If delta T tends to zero, then the vector area of the triangle will approach the area swept out the position vector during the time interval delta T. We can use this approximation with the triangular area to define the aerial velocity of the point mass traveling on the ellipse, if we take the ratio of vector area of the triangle to the duration delta T, and compute the its limit as delta T tends to zero. Now we can approximate the cross product as follows. Rt plus delta T can be written as Rt plus the time derivative of Rt times delta T in the first order, which can be substituted into the cross product. If we factor out the terms in the square bracket, then the cross product of the position vector RT with itself vanishes. Then we obtain the cross product of RT and RT dot times delta T, and we can insert this result into the definition of the aerial velocity. We see that the derivative of the area vector A with respect to the time is equal to the half of the vector product of R, and R dot. Since R dot is simple the velocity of the body, the aerial velocity of the point mass is given by the half of the cross product of its position vector and its velocity. If the plane of the elliptical trajectory of the motion is seen with a given inclination angle, we can show the result of this cross product in three dimensions. Here we see the instantaneous location P of the body which is described by the moving position vector R. The velocity V is the tangent to the elliptical trajectory at the point P. Both the position vector and the velocity of the body lie in the plane of the ellipse. Since the cross product of these vectors gives the aerial velocity, the later one is perpendicular to the plane of the ellipse, that is points in the direction of the z-axis. It is useful to derive the aerial velocity expressed in cylindrical coordinates, where the coordinate system is attached to the fixed point, chosen as the reference point of the motion. We already derived the position vector written in the cylindrical coordinates rho, phi and z. It is equal to rho times the basis vector e rho. Since we talk about planar motion, its z component vanishes. The velocity, which is tangential to the ellipse in point P, is given by rho dot times the basis vector E rho, plus rho times phi dot times the basis vector E phi. Then the vector product of the position vector and the velocity is equal to rho times E rho multiplied by rho dot times E rho, plus rho times phi dot times E phi. We can factor out the terms in the parenthesis, and the cross product of E rho with itself vanishes. Since the cross product of E rho and E phi gives E z, we obtain rho squared times phi dot times e z. Since the aerial velocity of the body has only a z component, it is perpendicular to the plane of the motion, as expected. Let us replace the coordinate rho with r, and the azimuthal angle phi with theta, 
which are the more popular notations of these coordinates in this context. Of course the radial coordinate R is the distance of the body from the reference point, here the fixed point F1. Theta is the central angle measured at the reference point between the position vector R of the body and a chosen reference direction, here the x-axis. Then we can write the magnitude of the aerial velocity of a moving body, as the half of the square of its distance R from the reference point of the motion, times the derivative of the central angle theta with respect to the time t. In the case of planetary motion, or more generally, in the case of bodies orbiting in the gravitational field of another object, the aerial velocity of the orbiting body is conserved. Motivated by these examples, we will derive the equations of motion for elliptical motion with constant aerial velocity. If we attach a polar coordinate system with the origin O to any of the foci of the elliptic trajectory, then the position of the orbiting point mass is given by the position vector with the radial coordinate R, and the azimuthal angle phi. When we determine the equations of motions for circular motion, we use the general form of the kinematic quantities expressed in polar coordinates. In the general case of the elliptic motion, the position of a moving body is given by the radial coordinate R and the azimuthal angle phi, which are some given functions of the time t. The relationship between these two coordinates is described with the polar equation. The velocity of the body is the tangent to its orbit at the point P. Its radial component is equal to the derivative of the radial coordinate R with respect to the time. Its azimuthal component is given by the radial coordinate R times the derivative of the azimuthal angle phi with respect to the time. Since the motion of the body is not uniform, its acceleration is not perpendicular to the velocity. The radial component of the acceleration is equal to our double dot, minus r times the square of phi dot, and its azimuthal component is given by r times phi double dot, plus 2 times r dot times phi dot. Now we assume that the aerial velocity of the traveling body is constant, that is the magnitude of the time derivative of the area A swept out by the body is constant along the motion. As a result, the half of the square of the radial coordinate r, times the derivative of the azimuthal angle phi is constant. By virtue of this equation, we can state that r squared times phi dot is equal a given constancy. Since the aerial velocity is constant, the aerial acceleration vanishes and the derivative of this equation is equal to zero. This gives the expression stating that 2 times r times r dot times phi dot plus r squared times phi double dot vanishes. Since the radial coordinate r is not equal to zero, we can divide this equation by r. Then, 2 times r dot times phi dot plus r times phi double dot is equal to zero. But we recognize that this expression is equal to the azimuthal component of the acceleration, that is a phi is zero. Therefore, the acceleration of the traveling body points in the opposite direction of its position vector, if its aerial velocity is constant along the orbit. Now we can present the equations of motion for elliptic orbits with constant aerial velocity. The position of the body is still given by the radial coordinate r and the azimuthal angle phi as functions of time. As already stated, the radial coordinate can be expressed in the term of the polar angle by the polar equation. This expression is the trajectory equation of the orbiting body. The radial component of the velocity of the body is given by the derivative of the radial coordinate r with respect to the time. Its azimuthal coordinate is equal to the radial coordinate r times the derivative of the azimuthal angle phi with respect to the time. By substituting the magnitude of the aerial velocity in this expression, we can write the azimuthal component as 2 times the length of the aerial velocity divided by the radial coordinate r. This equation is still a general expression for elliptical orbits. If we take the conservation of the aerial velocity into account, we can see that v phi is equal to the constant c divided by the radial coordinate r. This means that the azimuthal component of the velocity of the orbiting body is inversely proportional to its distance from the foci, where c is the proportionality constant. The radial component of the acceleration of the body is equal to r double dot, minus r times the square of phi dot, whereas its azimuthal component vanishes. The second term of the radial component can be expressed in the term of the aerial velocity, as 4 times the square of a dot divided by the cube of r. This is a general expression for elliptic motion. For the constant aerial velocity, we can write the radial component of the acceleration as the derivative of the radial velocity with respect to the time, minus the square of the constant c divided by the cube of the radial coordinate. As we have demonstrated, the azimuthal component of the acceleration vanishes in the case of constant aerial velocity. Since the acceleration has only a radial component, we talk about central motion, that is the acceleration always points towards a central point, which is one of the foci of the ellipse. However, 
The vanishing as a muffle component of the acceleration does not mean that the traveling body has no acceleration along its orbit. The tangential acceleration of the body is the projection of the radial acceleration onto the tangential direction, which is given by the scalar product of the acceleration and the normalized velocity. The latter one is the unit tangent to the elliptical orbit. This projection does not vanish, even if the aerial velocity of the body is constant. The last type of motion discussed among basic motions is helical motion. We talk about helical motion when a body moves on a helical shape path. That is, the trajectory of the traveling body is a helix. It is a spatial motion, and is not necessarily a uniform one. In nature or in everyday life we meet different types of helical motion, where the speed of the traveling body is either constant or changing along its path. Since the helix is not a closed space curve, the helical motion cannot be periodic. However, the projection of the motion on the plane perpendicular to the axis of the helix is a circle, along which the motion can be periodic. That is, the body can take the same time t to complete each revolution around the circle, where t is the period of the motion. Let us consider some examples for helical motion. The most famous example for such a type of motion is the motion of the electron or any charged particle in a homogeneous magnetic field. The particle propagates along a helical path, if its initial velocity is not parallel with the magnetic field lines. The trajectory of this motion can be recorded in a cloud chamber, where visible water droplets are induced to form around charged particles moving in the chamber, as seen in this photo. Here the speed of the particle is constant along the helix, and only the direction of its velocity changes. Another example from our everyday life is the sliding on the spiral water slide. In such water slides water is pumped to the top and let flow down freely on the inner surface, which reduces the friction of the slider spiraling down quickly. Since the slider has a gravitational acceleration, the speed of a person sliding down is increasing. As a result, the slider has not a helical motion in a strict sense. The path of the sliding has a spiral shape, where the diameter of the spiral is gradually increasing during the motion, as the accelerating slider is more and more pushed outward along the slide. We can also find examples for helical motion in industrial technologies. Spiral conveyors transfer loads from one level to another one. They are made of modular belt, that twisted around of a drum in the center. The belt is sliding on rails with low friction, which are fixed on external vertical support columns. If the diameter of the drum is constant along the axis of the conveyor, then the speed of the transferred load is constant as well. Such conveyors provide a quick and effective transfer of products, without interrupting the conveying process. As stated above, the projection of a helix on the plane perpendicular to its axis gives a circle. Therefore helical motion is the superposition of a linear motion parallel with the axis of the helix and a circular motion in the plane perpendicular to the axis. We can denote the velocity of the linear motion by VL, and the velocity along the circle in the plane perpendicular to the axis of the helix by VC. The velocity V of the body traveling on the helix is the vector sum of the velocity VL and VC, which determines the instantaneous direction and speed of the motion along its trajectory. Now we present the equations of motion of a body traveling on a helix at a constant speed with respect to a given frame of reference. We assume that the speed of the body is constant in the direction of the axis of the helix, and its angular velocity projected on the plane perpendicular to the axis is also constant. In this case the motion is uniform along the helical trajectory, that is the body is moving with a constant speed. Here a body approximated as a point mass is traveling on a helix, and its instantaneous position is denoted by the point P on the trajectory of the motion. We attach a Cartesian coordinate system to the frame of reference such that it is adapted to the helix. We chose the axis of the helix as the z-axis of the coordinate system, where the origin of the coordinate system is an arbitrary point on the axis of the helix. Then the projection of the helix on the xy plane perpendicular to the z-axis describes a circle with a radius r. The position p of the moving body can be described by the position vector r with the following coordinates. Its x-coordinate is equal to the radius r times the cosine of omega times the time t, and its y-coordinate is given by the radius r times the sine of omega times t. This is the parametric equation of the circle. The rotation angle phi is measured between the position of the body projected on the circle in the xy plane and the x-axis. The angular frequency omega is constant, and it is given by 2 pi divided by the period t of the circular motion. Then the angle phi can be written as the angular frequency omega times the time t. The vertical position of the body is determined by the linear uniform motion along the z-axis. It is given by the z-coordinate, 
which is equal to the z component vz of the velocity of the body times the time t. Since we have decomposed the motion of the body into linear and circular parts, we can write the position vector r as the vector sum of the vector r l describing the linear uniform motion, and the vector rc describing the circular motion. Here the x and y components of the vector are l vanish, and its c component is equal to vz time t. The components of the vector are c or r times the cosine of omega times t, r times the sine of omega times t, and zero. The velocity v is given by the derivative of the position vector, and it is the tangent to the helical path at the point p. Its x component is equal to minus r times omega times the sine of omega times t, and its y component is given by r times omega times the cosine of omega times t. These components give the tangent to the circle in the plane of projection of the helix at the point P. The z component of the velocity is just equal to vz, which is constant. Then we can also decompose the velocity v into the velocity vl of the linear uniform motion and the velocity vc of the circular motion. Here the components of vl are 0, 0 and vz. The components of vc are minus r times omega times the sine of omega times t, r times omega times the sine of omega times t, and 0. The magnitude of the velocity is given by the square root of the sum of r squared times omega squared and the square of vz. The acceleration of the body is defined by the derivative of its velocity. Its x component is equal to minus r times omega squared times the cosine of omega times t. Its y component is given by minus r times omega squared times the sine of omega times t. Since the motion is uniform in the direction of the z-axis, the z component of the acceleration vanishes. The magnitude of the acceleration is equal to r times omega squared. The acceleration vector remains horizontal during the motion and always points towards the axis of the helix, as seen in the figure. Since helical motion is a spatial motion, we can demonstrate the application of the frenet serret frame for the kinematic description of the body traveling along a helix. We have seen that the position vector r is given by the following components. The x component is equal to r times the cosine of omega times t. The y component is given by r times the sine of omega times t. And the z component is equal to vz times t. The derivative of the position vector r with respect to the time t is the velocity, which is the parametric derivative of the position vector describing the helix. Then the components of r dot are the following. The x component is equal to minus r times omega times the sine of omega times t. The y component is given by r times omega times the cosine of omega times t. And the z component is equal to vz. The length of the vector r dot is given by the square root of r squared times omega squared plus vz squared. The unit tangent t to the trajectory of the point mass is just the normalized parametric derivative of the position vector, that is r dot divided by its length. Then the tangent t is equal to 1 over the square root of r squared times omega squared plus vz squared, times the vector with the following components. Minus r times omega times the sine of omega times t, r times omega times the cosine of omega times t, and vz. Now we can differentiate the tangent with respect to time, which gives 1 over the square root of r squared times omega squared plus vz squared, times the vector with the following components. Minus r times omega squared times the cosine of omega times t, minus r times omega squared times the sine of omega times t, and 0. We can factor out minus r times omega squared and write t dot as the ratio of minus r times omega squared to the square root of r squared times omega squared plus vz squared, times the vector with the components cosine omega t, sine omega t, and 0. The length of t dot is just the magnitude of the cofactor of the vector, that is the ratio of minus r times omega squared to the square root of r squared times omega squared plus vz squared. Since the normal end of the helix is given by t dot divided by the length of t dot, we obtain the vector with the components minus cosine omega t, minus sine omega t, and 0. We already know that the derivative of a vector along a curve is perpendicular to the vector. Since the normal n is the normalized derivative of the tangent t, the vectors t and n are perpendicular to each other. That is, their scalar product with each other vanishes. However, their vector product does not vanish, and the binormal vector b is defined by the cross product of the tangent t and the normal n. Then the vector b is equal to the ratio of minus r times omega squared to the square root of r squared times omega squared plus vz squared, times the vector with the following components. vz times sine omega t, minus vz times cosine omega t, and r times omega times the square of sine omega t plus r times omega times the square of the cosine omega t. 
Here the last component of the vector reduces to r times omega. Since the length of the cross product of the normalized vectors is equal to 1 if those vectors are perpendicular to each other, we see that the binormal b is also a unit length. Now we have derived the expressions of the vectors t, n and b of the moving frame for the helical motion. When we apply the fernet serret frame for the kinematic description of the body traveling on the helix, we can determine the curvature and the torsion of the trajectory of the moving body. We saw that the moving frame consists of the tangent t, the normal n, and the binormal b at the instantaneous point p of the body traveling on the helix. We already determined the relationship between the derivatives of the tangent vector t with respect to the time t and the arc length s. We obtain that t dot is equal to the t prime times s dot, where the prime denotes the derivative with respect to the arc length. Since the derivative of the arc length s is equal to the length of the derivative of the position vector r, t dot is given by t prime times the length of t dot. Then the derivative of the tangent t with respect to the arc length is given by t dot divided by its length. If we substitute the expressions derived for t dot and the length of r dot into the right hand side, we obtain minus r times omega squared divided by r squared times omega squared plus vz squared times the vector with the components cosine of omega t, sine of omega t, and zero. We also saw that the curvature kappa of any space curve is given by the length of the derivative of the tangent t with respect to the arc length. Since the length of the vector in the expression for t prime is unity, the curvature is equal to the cofactor in this expression, that is the ratio of times omega squared to r squared times omega squared plus vz squared. If we divide both the numerator and the denominator by omega squared, we obtain the r over r squared plus the square of vz divided by omega. Now we will introduce the pitch of the helix, which is the distance traveled parallel to the axis of the helix in one complete turn. The pitch is denoted by zp, and it is equal to the velocity component parallel to the axis, that is vz, times the period t of the revolution. Since the period t can be written as 2 pi divided by the angular velocity omega, zp is equal to vz times 2 pi over omega. Then we can express the ratio of vz to omega as the pitch zp divided by 2 pi. This value is the pitch per unit degree, and we denote it by p. If we substitute this result into the expression obtained for the curvature, we can write kappa as the ratio of r to r squared plus p squared. This shows that kappa depends only the radius r and the pitch p of the helix, that is the curvature is a purely geometric quantity characterizing the space curve, and it is independent of the kinematic properties of the body moving on it. The tangent t and the normal n span the plane of the osculating circle touching the helix at the point p, and the reciprocal of the curvature kappa gives the radius rc of this circle. The expression obtained for kappa shows that the radius rc is greater than the radius r for the helix, and its value is increasing with increasing pitch of the helix. We also see from this expression if the radius r of the helix is much greater than the pitch, then the curvature is inversely proportional to the radius r, that is the radius of the osculating circle approaches the radius of the helix. Inversely, if the radius of the helix is negligible to the pitch, that is we straighten the helix, it loses its curvature and kappa is approximately zero. The derivative of the binormal b with respect to the time is given by 1 over the square root of r squared times omega squared plus vz squared, times the vector with the following components. vz times omega times the cosine of omega times t, vz times omega times the sine of omega times t, and zero. As in the case of the tangent t, the derivative of the binormal b with respect to the arc length can be written as the ratio of b dot to the length of r dot. Then b prime is equal to 1 over r squared times omega squared plus vz squared, times the vector with the following components. vz times omega times the cosine of omega times t, vz times omega times the sine of omega times t, and 0. This expression can be applied to compute the torsion tau of the space curve, which is given by minus the normal n times b prime. Then tau is equal to the ratio of vz times omega squared to the sum of r squared times omega squared and vz squared. By dividing both the numerator and the denominator by omega square, we obtain the ratio of vz divided by omega to the sum of r square and the square of vz divided by omega. We can substitute the pitch p in this expression, which gives p over r squared plus p squared. Then we see that the torsion tau of the helix also depends only on the radius r and the pitch p. If the radius r is much greater than the pitch p of the helix, the curve does not lift or twist up off the osculating plane much, and the torsion tau diminishes. If the radius is negligible to the pitch p, then the torsion tau is inversely proportional to the pitch p. 
Now we can summarize the equations of motion for helical motion, and determine the kinematic quantities of the body traveling on a helix in the moving frame. We already determined the Cartesian coordinates of the moving body in the coordinate system adapted to the helical trajectory. Its x-coordinate is equal to the radius r of the helix times the cosine of the angular frequency omega times the time t. Its y-coordinate is given by r times the sine of omega times t, and its c-coordinate is equal to the vertical velocity vz times the time t. Due to the symmetry of the helix, we can also use cylindrical coordinates adapted to the space curve, where the axis of the helix is still the z-axis. Then the coordinates of the position vector are the following. The distance of the body from the z-axis is given by the row coordinate, which is equal to the radius r. Thus rho is a constant. The azimuthal angle phi of the position of the body is given by the omega times t, where the angular velocity is constant. The z-coordinate of the cylindrical coordinate system is the same as the one of the Cartesian coordinate system. We saw that the velocity of the body traveling on the helix has the following Cartesian coordinate components. Its x-component is given by minus r times omega times the sine of omega times t. Its y-component is equal to r times omega times the cosine of omega times t, and the z-component of the velocity is constant. We can also give the components of the velocity in cylindrical coordinates. Its radial component vanishes, since there is no displacement in the radial direction during the helical motion. Its azimuthal component is equal to the radius r times the angular velocity omega. The z component of the velocity is simply vz. The components of the acceleration of the body in the Cartesian coordinate system are the following. Its x component is given by minus r times omega squared times the cosine of omega times t. Its y component is given by minus r times omega squared times the sine of omega times t, and its z component vanishes. The cylindrical components of the acceleration are the following. The radial component of the velocity is equal to minus r times omega squared, and both the azimuthal and the axial component of the acceleration vanish. These equations demonstrate that uniform helical motion is the composition of uniform linear motion and uniform circular motion. The first two component equations expressed in both type of coordinate systems are the equations of motion for uniform circular motion. The axial components of the kinematic quantities give the equations of motion for uniform linear motion. If we attach a Fernet Serret frame to the body moving on the helix, we can determine the kinematic quantities of the body in the moving frame, which has three parameters. The radius r of the helix, the angular frequency of the moving body, and the pitch p of the helix. We can express the frame vectors in the terms of these parameters. The tangent t is given by 1 over the square root of r squared plus p squared, times the vector with the following components. Minus r times the sine of omega times t, r times the cosine of omega times t and p. If we introduce the parameter beta as the ratio of r to p, which is the ratio of r times omega to vz, then r and p can be absorbed into one parameter. As a result, we have reduced the parameters describing the frame vectors to two independent quantities, omega and beta. Therefore the tangent t can be written as 1 over the square root of 1 plus beta squared times the vector with the following components. Minus beta times the sine of omega times t, beta times the cosine of omega times t, and 1. The normal n has the following components. Minus cosine omega times t, minus sine omega t, and 0. We see that n depends on only one parameter, the angular velocity omega. The binormal b is given by 1 over the square root of r squared plus p squared, times the vector with the following components. p times the sine of omega times t, minus p times the cosine of omega times t and r. If we apply the reduced parameters, we can write b as 1 over the square root of 1 plus beta squared times the vector with the following components. sine omega times t, minus cosine of omega times t and beta. For a given set of parameters we can determine the frame vectors at any instant of time, that is at any point on the helix. This helps us to describe the instantaneous velocity and acceleration of the body in this frame. When we presented the formalism of the fernet serret frame attached to a moving body, we determine the velocity of the body in this frame, which is equal to the speed v of the body, times the tangent t to the trajectory of the motion at the given point. Similarly, we demonstrated that the acceleration of the body can be written as the tangential component at of the acceleration times the tangent t, plus the ratio of the speed v squared to the curvature radius rc at of the trajectory in the given point times the normal n. This expression can also be written as v dot times the tangent t plus the square of speed v times the curvature kappa times the normal n. Since we already determined all the quantities in these equations, 
we can give the components of the velocity and the acceleration in the moving frame. The tangential component of the velocity is equal to the speed v, which is the length of the time derivative of the position vector. Then we have the square root of r squared times omega squared plus vz squared. The normal and binormal components of the velocity vanish. The components of the acceleration are the following. Its tangential component is the derivative of the speed with respect to the time. Since the speed is constant, the tangential component vanishes. The normal component of the acceleration can be written as the ratio of v squared to rc or v squared times kappa. If we substitute the expression obtained for v and kappa into the right-hand side, we obtain the radius r times the square of the angular velocity omega. The binormal component of the acceleration is zero. Let us summarize the content of this presentation on the kinematic description of basic motions. We started with the simplest form of motions, uniform linear motion. We determined the mathematical expressions of the kinematic quantities characterizing a body traveling on a straight line at a constant speed, and derived its equations of motion. The next type of motion we studied was free fall. We presented Galileo's inclined plane experiment in which he studied this phenomenon. We also discussed his computations and provided a quantitative description of free fall. A more detailed analysis of the equations of motion was given by presenting the experiment with Morin's free fall apparatus which is designed to plot the trajectory of the motion versus the time. Both linear motion and free fall are one-dimensional motions, where bodies travel along a straight line. We also discussed a third type of one-dimensional motion, namely simple harmonic motion or harmonic oscillation. The equations of motion were determined for harmonic oscillation, which were studied both in time and frequency domains by applying the complex representation of the kinematic quantities of the oscillating bodies. After having presented one-dimensional motions, we continued with periodic planar motions, that is, where bodies travel along some closed curve in a plane. We started with circular motion, where we studied both uniform and non-uniform motion along circular trajectories. Based on simple geometrical principles, we determined the equations of motion of body traveling on circles. We also discussed a more general periodic planar motion, namely elliptical motion, and we derived the trajectory equation of the orbiting body. We considered a special case of elliptic motion, where the aerial velocity of the body is constant, and computed the equations of motion for the traveling body. Finally we presented helical motion, as an example of spatial motions. Here we derived the equations of motion from the parametric equation of the helix, and we could apply the frenet seric frame attached to the body traveling on the helical trajectory. This helped us to determine the geometric parameters of the helix, and we could write the kinematic quantities of the body in the terms of the frame vectors.